Welcome to HP Labs. And welcome to what is the preeminent, was the preeminent research institution in the valley, the origin of the valley. And not only welcome to HP Labs, but welcome to HP, the original startup of Silicon Valley. And so what we're going to do here over the next day and a half is we're going to open up, we're going to open up our kimono. And we're going to invite you in and we're going to show you things we haven't shown to people in many, many years. Now, we're not, you're not going to see everything. You know, we will keep a few secrets of some of our longer term technologies that we have. Um, but you're going to see a very good glimpse into how we look at the future. Now, HP Labs has been around 50 years. We celebrate the 50th anniversary. That's why we're obviously <coughs> gathered here today. And uh, this is a research institution that's created many of the great inventions that have fueled this company. Everything from light emitting diodes, you know, that, that uh, we actually, you know, depend on for a lot of our communications today, to inkjet printing that fueled a revolution in print, to what Wired Magazine called the first desktop computer, which also later came with uh, the first touch, if you ever were in that era and you got a chance to see what touch was like in the very primitive days. So a lot of the core technologies that are in, in parts of the valley today and that we're used to, to really grow HP were created right here in the labs. But more importantly, what we want to do is we want to talk about the future. And we want to talk about what we see for the next 30 years. And so we go on to that venture. What I want you to do is I want you to look, and I want you to think, and I want you to interact. We have, we have labbies all around. There are HP fellows who will be circulating among you. There are researchers among you. And you're going to get the raw research people you're going to get a chance to talk to. These are techies. These are not polished people. They're not marketing people. These are raw techies you'll get a chance to talk to. And as you go through, feel free. Talk about the next 50 in tech. Tweet about it. Tell your story. Now, let's talk about our story and how we look at the future. One of the things I always get asked is, OK, you're in HP Labs. What is, you know, what's the next great thing in tech? What are you the most excited about? And I give them an answer that they don't ever expect. And the reason is the way we look at technology and the way we frame what we do in HP Labs is not by starting with the technology. It's not by starting of, you know, what's the latest process node, memory technology, processor configuration. It's not even by looking at what is IDC's report or Gartner's report or anything else. All of those are pieces that fill in that we bring in to bear later on. But where it really starts, it starts with people. And it starts with how we look at society, what we see is going on for the next 30 years. The socioeconomic, the demographic, the government changes. And we look at that in that 30-year time horizon. We use that to frame it. Now, why do we do that? And the reason is what we do is try and frame our research by solving the biggest problems that society faces. Now, we can't address them all, and we're not going to pretend to. But what we can do is take the capabilities, the competencies that we have in HP and the labs, and see how we can bring them to bear in solving these problems. So we start with people. Now I'm going to give you a quick snapshot. You're going to get the two minute version of this, of something that goes on all year and then culminates in a grand report out to our executive staff and drives through a lot of our aspects. So you're going to get the quick version of it. And I'm going to highlight four things. One, when you look at the next 30 years, what you see is a rapid change in how we live, where you start seeing mass urbanization. Now we have it today. But when we look for the next 30 years, there are going to be profound changes that are going to impact everything about how we interact, how we design products, how we manage precious resources. All of that is going to change fundamentally about how we design products. If you, if you rewind just a little bit, in 1991, there were 10 megacities in the world. A megacity is defined as 10 million people or more. By 2030, there will be 41 megacities. And by the end of our 30-year time frame, you're going to have over 50 megacities. And those megacities are going to be predominantly located outside 
of the mature markets. In fact, most of them are going to be in China and India, but there's also going to be the rise of cities sitting in Africa as the dark continent starts to be lit up. And those changes are going to affect everything about humanity. And so thinking about what are, the, what are the solutions we need to bring to bear to address those issues becomes a framing piece for what we do in HP Labs. Second big thing is changing demographics. So today we focus on the millennials, certainly from our marketing standpoint with our product guys. Very heavy focus on the millennials. But when you zoom forward 30 years, there's going to be a profound change in what population looks like. So first of all, over 97% of the world's growth in that time frame will occur in emerging markets. That means only 3% of the growth will occur in US and Western Europe. Further, it's an aging population. In that 30 years, over half of the population will be over 50 years old. They'll be living longer, and they'll have expectations about how they live, expectations about quality of life, and they will look for technologies and simple solutions in which they can go address those. And finally, we're going to have generations that are coming up who grew up with technology from the time they were born. We see that today, where people come out and you know it was like they were born with a phone on their hand. But that technology will be new technology that will come out, and it will profoundly influence how they look at the world around them. Third is hyper-globalization. Now, despite maybe the move to build walls or erect barriers and the like, the move to a global environment will be unstoppable for many reasons. One of them is just the emergence of, of geographies like China or India or Africa. But it will also be because of technology itself. Now, an interesting aspect of a hyper-globalization is that we've moved into an environment in which we expect things to happen instantly. For something that gets created, for it to move internationally at the speed of light. And what does that was the internet. But what I want to share with you today, and you're going to hear more about throughout the day, is that's only the beginning. Because what will happen is our products will move at nearly that speed, where an idea can go from a digital idea, a representation of somebody's thought in their head, into a physical instantiation in a time that you can't even imagine today. And we're going to talk about exactly how that will happen. One other piece on globalization is if you look, by 2025, over half of the Fortune 500 companies will be located outside of the United States. So you're going to see an international world. And how we design, how we develop products, how we do research is going to be profoundly influenced by this direction. And finally, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, though I will say we do think about it a lot internally, is just the accelerated pace of innovation, how fast things are changing. You know, it's why you know, the tablets, phablets, and phones you have today aren't going to be 10 times more powerful in 10 years. They will be a billion times more powerful. And so the usage models, what they can do, are only the things that we can dream of. And that's only 10 years. So as we look at this and we look at what the next 30 years brings for humanity, we've created a very simple vision. And it's an anchoring vision that we use within the labs. We use it to frame the projects that we do. We actually use it from a company-wide as well. And we call this blended reality. Simple notion. It's the people, places, and things. It's us. It's humanity. How it interacts with our digital reality. How we compute, how we, compute, how we communicate, how we analyze. And when it can occur in a virtuous reinforcing cycle, it disappears into the background and becomes an, becomes an additive positive effect on our lives. You see it in everything around us. You see it in medical today, when the technology attaches to the body to monitor physical aspects of you, to make alerts and to make changes that can turn around and affect your health. You see it out in agriculture, with the tractor that's going through the field that you just look like is a simple tractor in the field, but is networked that can look at entire images, that can analyze the soil, that can take actions based on what it sees real time and turn back around and change the amount of nutrients in the right place at the right time. It is when the technology disappears into the background to solve human needs. That's blended reality. 
Now it anchors several things that we do. I'm going to highlight four, and you're going to see how we're going to use these to address some of the big issues of humanity. But the four I want to talk about are one, 3D transformation. Now that sounds like a funny, quirky name, but I'm hoping by the end of tomorrow or today, you'll get a good idea of, of how profound this change will be. So it's a simple idea. It's a simple idea that we work in a 3D world. We interact with objects here today, but the environment that we work in is 2D. So what we believe in is a vision in which what you can do is take physical objects, you can scan them in, you can edit, change, colorize, personalize, make it yours in a 3D environment where you can manipulate it, and with a push of a button, it comes back out as a real, physical, instantiated product at the end, operating in that full 3D. And what that will do is enable the next industrial revolution and what I will call digital manufacturing. Now, I'll leave you a footnote on that because we're going to come back and we're going to talk about exactly what that means here in a couple panels. But it will be revolutionary. It will change how we work in cities. It will change all aspects of humanity. I'll come back and talk about that. Second big one here is Internet of All Things. Now, we all know what IoT is, right? Um, in fact, at HP, we have one of the largest deployments of IoT, but you would never think about it that way. And the reason is, it is printers. Printers are things. They actually are almost all of them now connected to the internet. And you probably didn't know, but there's a big data engine sitting behind them. There's actually an if, this, then, that engine sitting there. And there's a whole set of heuristics that go around how you can manage that independently. It's how we deliver services like Instant Ink. That will happen, and we do believe that is a reality upon us today. But the vision that we're driving to is, an, is the internet of all things. Every object that does not, even objects that do not have technology in them today, the table, the chair, the piece of paper, the plastic part, where every one of those can be uniquely tagged and identified and can be associated with an internet service. And think about the profound changes that will have on humanity. Everything in manufacturing from supply chains will change. Everything from security of how I track a part will change. The, the, the opportunities here are endless, and we'll talk about that here a little bit later, about the internet of all things. Third, microfluidics. Now, admittedly, that's a pretty techy item, but let me put it in context. What we have really at HP Labs, what we have at HP, is a really unique microfluidic engine and microelectronic machine. Now, today it gets employed in printers. Inkjet printers are essentially a complex MEMS machine that has the ability to move in very precise ways fluids. But if you take that same technology and you can apply it in a whole variety of reasons, you can solve some unique problems in the world today, in particular in healthcare, where you can move from a world where systems are centralized, where, where doing tests is very expensive and slow, into a world of mobile diagnostics, where things happen very cheaply, that the power of it is put into the hands of the individual. And that's what we mean by microfluidics, is transforming industries with new technology. And finally, I use hypermobility, and that is moving from the world of those glass slabs, those tablets, phablets, and phones that we stare at on average 137 times a day into a world in which it comes on body, in which it is part of us, now, maybe that comes in form of the simple wearable today. But eventually, it'll come in terms of things like attached to your body, on your body, in your body. When suddenly the compute becomes part of the ambient environment, and mobile becomes merely a way of life as it disappears into the background. 